And good morning, everyone, and welcome to Small Biz Matters, the half-hour program where you work on your business rather than in it. I am Alexi Boyd, your trusted small business advocate. I think I'll put the advocate hat on this week. (laughs) And I've got a very special guest on the show today, which I'm very excited about. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about what we're going to talk about on the show today. We're going to be talking about debt recovery. Now, that is a very scary term, and to be perfectly honest, it's something that you don't even want to consider as a business But it's something that you have to consider and you have to consider it from the word go when you're setting yourself up. And today's guest is going to be taking us through the process and taking us through uh, the pros and cons of different ways of dealing with debt recovery and some tips and tricks and good strategies that you can implement when you're starting your business to make sure that you've got a solid grounding to make sure that you don't end up with this situation. Uh, let's face it, every small business does have uh, this, this come up. It's, it's not dependent on the relationship you have with your clients. I don't think it's dependent on necessarily the, the paperwork that you have in place. It does end up happening. And a lot of it is about your relationship with your clients and how you deal with them on a one-to-one level. But if you don't have those papers or not the, those processes and procedures in place that protect you, um, you really are leading yourself in for a, a, a bad bad situation basically you're going to end up with a a lot of work a lot of extra work and possibly never seeing that debt again but it can take you down it's uh it's basically a handful of uncooperative clients or maybe a slip up in your client agreements um or and and it can cause a big problem with your cash flow and it's bigger enough that you can sometimes swallow your entire business whole so um is there any way you can avoid it well you can put steps in place to reduce that risk or when there's a worst case scenario, what are your rights? So today we've got Sean Kelleher, who is a locally based solicitor specialising in small business law. And he's actually developed a product and a process to support small businesses with debt recovery. Um, He's here with us to share his experience and valuable insight from which we can all learn. Welcome to the show, Sean. Thanks for coming along. Thanks, Alexi. Nice to be here. (laughs) First of all, can you just tell us a little bit about your background and what led you towards this, this area of your career? We're always fascinated to know where people's journeys go with regards to their experiences? Have they come from a corporate background? And what leads them into the small business world? Yeah, sure. Well, I, I've been a lawyer for 19 years now. Uh, I started off at GIO where um, there's a lot of recovery going on mm. day in, day out, big volumes. And obviously that's insurance based. But um, as far as getting a grounding for how recovery works and what works, what doesn't and what what pitfalls can um, uh, people can come across. Um, uh, that was great grounding for what I'm doing now. So uh, I was there for about, oh, it must have been about 15 years. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So I was there for a long time and then um, and then went into private practice um, and, and did the same sort of thing and set up debt recovery models um, with a, a law firm in the city for them to go out and they were servicing big um, uh, credit agencies. Um, So it's a little bit different from what I'm doing now. Um, But again, it gave me a really good grounding as to what works, what doesn't, and and putting efficient practices in place so that you can uh, service your clients and take that angst out of the the recovery process. What's really interesting about that is that a lot of people say they come from corporate and they turn everything on its head because they think that it doesn't work and they, they think they need to refine that process for the market that they're going into. Whereas you actually took a lot of that experience and felt that there were bits that did work and bits that didn't work. But you're saying that actually was a really good process and procedure to bring to your business. Yeah, it's been a real mix, a real mix. Like there's there's some really good things that I, I got out of the corporate corporate world. Um, and then there are other things which, which don't work in the corporate world, which allow me to service small businesses. Um, I mean, I'm sure you hear it all the time about how cloud-based products are reducing cost bases. People are now working not in your traditional offices. That's what I do, uh, which allows me to keep my cost base right down. Yes. So that I can service small business mm. in 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 relation to debts in this case, um, which might not necessarily be cost effective in that traditional model. Right. Yes. Well, yeah. long long gone are the days of shop fronts and uh, and you know big signs outside the front. It's definitely more of a cloud based model. Yeah. And and web based and that sort of thing. So let's talk about the debt recovery industry as a whole. Now, my experience with them is basically Dun and Bradstreet, D and B. Um, getting those letters can kind of freak um, any business out. One business that I've worked with previously was a medium sized company with twenty employees, and there was something like a one hundred and fifty dollar. Um, bill that it hadn't been paid because it was disputed and they went after that. Um, 
there's obviously that end of the spectrum and then there's the guys such as yourself who does it on a more on one on one basis. Can you just tell me about the two different models and what the pros and cons are? Yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, that even within the debt recovery agent uh, industry, there are there's a there's a wide scope. So there are debt recovery agents that do do the one on ones for small businesses and and they work quite well. Um, and then you've got the larger firms like the Duns and Brad's, Dun and Bradstreets that that uh, you know are more designed for businesses with ongoing book of debts. Ah, know, I see. Multiple multiple debtors which they are constantly chasing. Um, they work well for that that type of that type of business. Mm-hmm. Um, large transactions, obviously not point of sale businesses um and they work i mean look they all work different ways but the competition is quite quite strong in that industry so um you know if you're interested in those types of agents uh, i'd encourage you to go off and 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 have a chat to them because they all do work differently but generally speaking um they work on a percentage of of the debt um normally they would recover their fee first Yep. So, for instance, if um, you know, if you've got a debt of a thousand dollars, um, and they they're taking you know whatever it is X percent, um, they'll take that X percent first before you see your ah, oh, that's interesting your recovery. Um, but look, to to be honest, they all work differently, and you should you should speak to them first before um, uh, before you know considering all your all of your options. Yeah, and yeah. it's interesting that it, that you said that works well for people who have got ongoing debtors, and it's it's a constant battle for them to keep on top of them, and it happens on multiple levels. Yeah, as well, and uh, and so tell me how that works with someone such as yourself. I can imagine that the way you work with your clients is very much one on one. And even the way you work with their suppliers and those who owe them money is almost more personal as well compared to the Dun and Bradstreets who have call centres based overseas. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, with the Dun and Bradstreets, you, you're effectively outsourcing your credit controller. Mm. You know, um, where you're at that level that you actually need one. Um, you know, you make that call whether that's more cost effective for you to use Dun and Bradstreet than than employ one yourself. Really. Well, and they just basically send out letters on mass. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a there's, it's really interesting. There's a code of conduct that that um, debt recovery agents have to abide by. Right. And actually, it applies to anyone who's chasing a debt. So even if you're chasing your own debt. Oh. You have to apply. You have to abide by this code, um, and if you meaning you can't go and break their legs in order to get the money back. Unfortunately, no. Right, well, fortunately, I understand. That is part of the code. Got it. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, you can't harass. There's only a certain amount of times uh, that you can call a person in Ooh, relation to the debt. Now that's There's, interesting. Yeah. So, I'd, I'd encourage if anyone is chasing their own debts. Just be careful. Have a look. Just Google, um, you know, debt recovery code of conduct. Australia. Australia. <laughs> Australia. <laughs> As opposed to Sicily. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, now have a look at it. But um, so I've got to abide by that. Anyone has to abide by that. Yeah. And that's, just um, make sure that you're you're actually compliant. Compliant. Yeah. Otherwise, otherwise you, you could, could end up in. <laughs> in you end up as getting well. complaints and things like that. You know, no one wants that. Um, so how? But how I work is is effectively I don't work on a percentage because for me the way. I, I'm entitled to commence proceedings on behalf of my client mm-hmm. if I if, if it gets to that. Mm-hmm. So um, and if you're doing that sort of work, you can't work on a percentage. I see. So you um, so what I do is I charge a, a flat fee. Yep. For um, uh, to send a let- the final letter of demand and a draft statement of claim, and that in my experience really puts the the debtor on notice go well this is serious now like you they're know. actually engaging with somebody legal yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. and you know what's interesting is i um i've done a little bit of debt recovery and now i'm, I'm actually going to go and check out that that google i'm going to google that actually make sure i'm doing things in a compliant way but just the simple act of writing on an email um you know my name is so and so i am a registered bass agent here is my ato bass agent number um, usually scare the pants out of people and it usually gets a little bit more activity or action than what the, the client might be trying to do themselves. Yeah, very, very rarely do you just see no action at all. You normally get a response and it does, I, I, I find, normally at least in, uh, brings the debtor and your client together again mm. and they're starting to have that conversation about, you know, 
getting that payment made. And it can dredge out old emails that your client has lost in relation to this matter where there's been a discussion or a dispute about what to be paid and it's actually the supplier who's pulled it out going, well, actually, this is what's been written, this is what was decided upon and matter closed. So Tell me, tell me about it. <laughs> tell me about it. I had, I had a client that, um, that you know, we engaged, we, I, wrote all, I wrote the letter of demand, draft the statement of claim, sent it across to... Um, the debtor and the debtor sent me back a, an email that he'd sent to my client saying the agreement was terminated, you know, <laughs> two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So it's usually those disorganised people. What would you say? It's, what's What would you say is the calibre of client? It, is it always the, the person who just hasn't got their act together and doesn't have things organised or the back end in place? Or is it a whole range of people? It's it's a whole range. Like, I mean, the, the most organised, uh, you know, business can have can have difficult debtors. Mm. I mean, it's just it's just the nature of the uh, it's the nature of business. Exactly. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if you're a consultant or you have product or whatever it is. That's exactly right. I was watching the news yesterday um, on Late Line on ABC. They were talking about um, all these uh, designers in Australia who just keep on seeing their designs ripped off within five minutes of posting them online and selling them. Um, and it's becoming so. Hopefully, the legislation is going to change there a little bit for them. Just talking in, in a legal capacity. Yeah. In terms of um, creative um, trademarking. Oh, copy copyright is a you know whole different ball game. Huge yeah, huge yeah. issue. So one of the ways you mentioned before about doing your research is to uh, make sure that you're compliant in the way that you're chasing your debt and you're not taking the Sicilian approach. Um, and But you do need to make sure when you're setting up things like client agreements, um, you can look into industry practice. So you can talk to people within your industry, maybe go to your professional association. And quite often, they have a great range of resources for you to use as a member, as a paying member, and they might have existing client agreements and, and give them a call. Because they might tell you, you know, this is what is typical within our industry. Yeah, it's so true, and and it's real. It's a really good way to start off because, um, I mean, almost every industry these days has an association. Yes. Um, and they're set up to do exactly that, and you know, there's no point in reinventing the wheel, and and you know, small business, you want to cut costs. You know, I mean, whilst I'd be you know, grateful if someone mm -hmm. came in and asked me to draft an agreement for them, it's just not really worth the money these days. You know, yes, when there's so many templates and things out so there. So much out there, and um, you know, absolutely, go to your go to your association, go to your industry body, do your own research because there's more than likely to be a template which is right for you, terms and conditions which are right for you, and they will have already done the research in in relation to what legislation applies, so that you know you you're you're covered in relation to that. Mm, and ensuring that it's, that it's already a legal document as is. So don't go fiddling too much with it, right? Don't go fiddle. Yeah, that's right. I mean, try agreements, particularly agreements to be paid, you need to keep it as simple as possible. Um, you know, if you've got an agreement already, if you want to have a look through it, um, one tip that I can give you is, you know, take out take out the adjectives. The adjectives. Yeah, take out the adjectives. So, <laughs> Do a search for adjectives. Yeah, for instance, like, you know, and, and look for things which aren't defined. You know, make sure that every critical term is defined and is not open to interpretation between me, oh, I see. the vendor, and, and you, the purchaser. So, so who is the, and they always put it in inverted commas, who is the supplier, who is the um, the vendor, who is the client, who yeah. is the, yeah. I'll give you a really good example. Um, uh, so, for instance, uh, recruiters, mm -hmm. okay, so they get paid um, normally upon the successful, uh, upon the engagement of, you know, their candidate, which they put forward to their client. Yes. Um, one uh, agreement I saw recently had, um, you know, payment due on the successful engagement. Now, what successful engagement? Yeah, what's your definition mean? of successful? Yeah. And particularly if there's a, the, particularly if there's a, uh, a dispute on payment, you know, absolutely London to a brick. You know, the uh, the the client will take a different view to you. A on classic example of successful. So they would have in their definitions on in that section of the contract, they will put successful. Um, this is defined as someone being placed after the probation period. Blah 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 blah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, make sure if if you're gonna have something, going to have something like that, 
make sure it's defined. But better is just to take out that adjective. Take well, out that's successful. our first tip today. Steer clear of adjectives. <laughs> <laughs> to get my 10-year-old to go through the dog, because I, I can't remember grammar, and she'll go through the dog and go, there's an adjective, there's an adjective, there's a proper noun. <laughs> 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 um, okay, so uh, that's an interesting topic about, um, about agreements in general. Um, I always find it quite wishy-washy with the whole payment terms. And I think this is across probably uh, my, my listeners will know that I'm, I'm a bookkeeper and and obviously the payment turns are something that I mean is is that does that hold any ground anymore isn't it just up to the client what that when they want to pay no, no I mean like payment term is a, is a critical term of the contract an essential term of the contract um, so it, it's the basis upon which a debt arises so uh, you know if there isn't a payment term in an agreement then there is no due date for the payment to be made. And so you have to call on the payment. It, it is does get quite messy. So you have to actually call on the payment and then provide them with a reasonable time on which to make the payment, which can all be avoided if you've got clear payment terms in in your terms and conditions. So with that, that's obviously great if you can get your client to actually sign an agreement when they begin, when they engage with you. Um, is it the same if you put the payment terms on your tax invoice? Is that still an agreement by which they're bound? It is, as long as it's reasonable and, and within an industry practice, then yes, it is. So if you put on your tax invoice, uh, terms are 14 days and it's within industry practice, you've done the research, and you, but you haven't actually discussed this with your client at any point, it, or it's not in writing, um, do you have a leg to stand on in terms of when that debt is due? You do, you do, because it, it, it is within industry practice and it's a reasonable time. But I mean, to avoid that altogether, it's just better to have upfront payment terms. And it's a very topical subject, isn't it? Because there's been a push in the last week for uh, us to move to the European model, which is to have an enforced 14-day um, due date for all invoices. I mean, I, I worked for a company where we dealt with the large pharmaceutical multinationals and their response was end of the month plus 60 days. That could potentially be three months before any payment is made, including a deposit for any work. So um, it, it will be great to see those changes happen um, on a federal level. That's that's something that's 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 an easy one. Do that, Malcolm Turnbull, to help small business instead of just kicking off your small business minister from your cabinet. But that's another discussion. So that's that that's quite topical at the moment, isn't it? Do you think that would, from what you've seen, would that help small business knowing that everybody has those payment terms? Would it speed up the small business economy in your in your mind? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, I mean, I think most people, I mean, if you look at their average debtors, you know, average payments, uh, like th they would have to be over a, over a month, 30 mm. days oh, for most, for most uh, businesses that don't have point of sale transactions. So, I mean, to have that and, and for, for business to just start to arrange mm. themselves so that they get themselves ready for 14 day turnarounds. Um, would be a huge benefit to small people. I know I'd, I'd benefit from it. Yeah, even even me personally. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly right. Um, look, you're listening to Small Biz Matters here on Triple H 100.1 with Sean Keller, her solicitor, and myself, Alexi Boyd. Uh, we will be back after these community service announcements. You are listening to Triple H 100.1 FM. <laughs> um, so we're back in the room with Sean at the moment talking about debt recovery and the issue that does affect all small businesses and it affects all of us because we should be prepared, of course. So let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, it, it, how to protect your business from non-payers from the beginning. We mentioned before the break, uh, ensuring that you've got the paperwork in place. If you can get your client to sign that client agreement, that'd be excellent. Um, and p concrete payment terms on invoices, estimates and quotes, which clearly talk about interest costs and late payment fees. Now, that obviously needs to be reasonable. You can't say, I'm going to double it every day that you're late. No. So what's a reasonable payment term for that interest and, and late payment fee section? Well, um, the current um, interest rate which you're entitled to claim if the matter goes to court is 6%. <laughs> so I okay. guess it's affected by the RBA. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. can't go crazy. You can you can claim um, <clears throat> uh, a higher rate than that, mm -hmm. um, but there is penalty. There are there are um, rates which you can't go above. So basically, the the best the best guide is probably the credit card rate. Okay. Or personal loan rate. Right. Um, you stick with under that, then you you you're going to be fair. Um, you you you'll be in. You know, reasonable there. territory. Right, right. And and in terms of the payment terms, can you give us a, an idea of what we should e exactly put 
on that invoice? Should it say payment terms are 14 days, payment terms are hoping to be 14 days? What do you, what do you write? Uh, well, as clear as possible. Um, there's no rule, but um, yeah, uh, 14 days from the date of the invoice or this invoice um, is, is fine. Um, it would be very hard to manage to put an actual date because you'd have to change the data each time you do an invoice. So mm-hmm. 14 days from the day of the invoice, you can put that down on the template. Yes. And that's fine. Yeah, and then and then you can be, then there's no discussion about when I received it. Oh, my email was down, it bounced back, I didn't receive it, and that's when I should be invoiced from. No, it's the actual invoice date that's printed on the PDF. That's right. And if you're, if you're um, emailing, a lot of, most people email their invoices these days, so you've got a record of when it was sent. Um, you'll have a record if it bounces back. You can even get a read receipt if you really want to, but that's not necessary as long as you can prove that you sent it on a particular date. That's the main thing. And that's legally binding, the send and the whether or not things bounce back and those sort of email conversations, they are... It's proof. Yeah, yeah excellent. Because yeah, yeah. it was a bit wishy-washy a few years ago because it was saying, I remember reading somewhere that it wasn't proof because emails can be manipulated further down the trail? That's changed now. So, like, oh. the world's caught up, the legal world's caught up with the technology <laughs> and, uh, you know, email... Email service is now considered to be uh, proper service. Excellent. Because I I guess somewhere down the track, if they needed to dig deep enough, they could find evidence of the original email and that sort of thing. That's right. And for those of you out there, let me put my bookkeeper's hat on for a second. For those of you out there who are still sending Word documents as invoices, stop doing that. Stop it. You should, it's everyone in the world can turn a Word document into a PDF. If you don't know how to do it, learn, find someone who can teach you. Don't send Word documents or Excel, even worse, because they can be changed and, uh, you know, dates and amounts and everything else can be changed. Don't send anything that can, can't be changed. I mean, PDFs can be changed if you're really clever, but, you know, they're, they're locked, so you can't, you know, manipulate them easily enough. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, PDF has to be PDF. So um, when, when you talk about setting up that relationship with your client, you mentioned in our, in our discussion leading up to the show that it's better to have a conversation rather than engagement terms. Does that mean you open it up to them to make suggestions about how they would like the relationship to unfold? Well, I mean, it depends on the client. You know, I mean, if it's a really important client and, and you're, you've got, um, you know, flexibility in relation to particular terms, then yeah, sure, then that's, uh, that'd be open to you. But I mean, the more, the more conversation that you have in relation to um, uh, uh, the engagement mm. um, and the following on from the conversation is an agreement Mm -hmm. okay so that shows that there has been a trail of communication between you and you've agreed on terms so from a from my perspective when i'm trying to prove that those terms were agreed to by the parties that's proof so that's good Mm. yeah so uh, what i find uh, uh, really helpful is when i'm first talking to someone as an initial conversation because obviously you're a person and you want to talk to them verbally i jump on the email and go thanks so much for having a chat today um you know here's what we discussed let me know if you're happy with this or as per our discussion dot bullet point bullet point bullet point so if you get it on there straight away while it's still fresh in your mind and then jot it down they almost feel as though you're more efficient and organized too right yeah absolutely and um and and attached to that email is and here are my usual standard terms and conditions yes yeah and yep. there they are so so that if they have an issue with them well then then they can come back to you but otherwise you've sent them mm-hmm. they've got them they follow on and they engage you, mm-hmm. then they've engaged you on those terms and conditions that, which you sent to them. That's right, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, it's funny we were talking about industry practice and checking with what's ac- acceptable for your particular industry group. Uh, a lot of industries, like especially with bookkeepers, I have a seven-page engagement letter, which I think I've read once. It's very unlikely that a client's going to read. Is that going to put people off or is it just really good to have something solid? And in your experience, what, what's the relate? Like, does that help you build a relationship with your client or does it put them off? Oh, uh, look, uh, it, it's, it's a, that's a really difficult question. I mean, you know, if you need seven pages, then you need to send seven pages. Mm. I mean, my cost agreement is, you know, is three or four pages as well and, and can run out to seven pages depending on the complexity of the matter. Mm. So, um, uh, you know, if it's if it's essential that it, it cover all those points, then you need to put it. But, I mean, if, if it, it, but carve it down, cut it down to just the, just the essentials. And get rid of adjectives. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <that's right. laughs> okay, so you, you, you're, you're toggling along with your business, everything's going well and you suspect that your client's not likely to pay. They're not 
responding to invoices. You're not responding to any conversation once the email goes out. You don't feel like you've done anything wrong, but where do you go to from there? Um, well, the, the first point is the conversation. I mean, getting on the phone, you've got the relationship with the client, particularly if it's an ongoing client, it's not just a you know, one-off sale. Um, speak to them about it and, and um, say, did you receive the invoice? Um, have, have, you know, is, is there any issue? How, do you want to, do you want to have a discussion about it? Um, you know, the, it's, it was due on X date, mm. you know, I gave you a call, sent you a couple of emails, mm. do you want to have a chat? And um, so, you know, you'd not, you know, that's not going to offend anybody by having that sort of conversation and you're not going to get any client offside by, by approaching it that way. And, and the good credit controllers, and I used to sit next to one. Um, she used to be on the phone. She'd be having those friendly conversations all the time, and um, and and that's the way of getting the result yourself. Okay, be friendly, sure. be yeah, nice, be friendly, be friendly. I mean, you know, uh, most, you know, if you if you're business to business, you know, most other businesses want to want to stay in business, mm. you know, and they and they they don't want to have the reputation of being, uh, you know, bad payers um, a, around the place. So most of the time, it's you just need to understand what their what their issue is. And if can you make any? I know we're talking about what, what's acceptable in terms of the way that you engage with them at this point. Are you allowed to? I don't want to say. I want to use the word threaten. It's probably not the right word. But are you allowed to threaten them with? Look, this is going to affect your credit rating, um, or or I'm going to tell other people in the business. Oh, I, I mean, know. I know you don't want to get aggressive, definitely. Yeah, yeah. But are you allowed to use that expression, credit rating? I mean, do we have any rights as businesses to affect other people's credit ratings? Well, um, well, yeah, only I, when you engage with the Dun and Bradstreets does that happen. Yeah, judgments. If you get a judgment out against against you, that will will ordinarily go on your credit rating. Right. Um, and so that can affect everything from mm. getting a mobile phone to credit card loan, um, whatever. So um, it can affect your credit rating if it ultimately goes down that um, path, but. At the stage that where you're having a conversation with your client or you're sending an email to your client, um, threatening is not a good idea. Right. Yeah. Keep it. Keep it. Just. I did the work. Mm-hmm. I sent the invoice. You were happy. The yep. Yeah, the invoice was um, uh, due on this date. I haven't received payment. Mm-hmm. Please pay as soon as possible. Keep it that simple. Mm. Um, okay. Succinct. Succinct. Yep. And um, yeah. I mean, basically, when you get to uh, court proceedings. In debt recovery, for most of the, most of the time, that's as simple as it is. Yeah, at the end of the day, they're just going to be looking at what were the payment terms, why hasn't this person paid, what sort of communication. Well, it's the same thing that you're. You can do the same thing as as what a, a legal professional can do if you if you decide to go down that path. As a judge can do, everyone's still looking at the same paperwork, right? Ex- exactly. I mean, I'd love to say there's like you know great legal expertise in doing this, but it's not. Um, it really comes down to. Um, you know, you could do it yourself, mm. but whether you want to spend the time and the angst doing it. Yeah, so it's 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 outsourcing, essentially. Effectively, yeah. Yeah, and it's a very stressful dis- discussion. I'll be honest with everyone today. I had a discussion with one of my clients yesterday because I wanted to fire them and I, I was done. I, he, he's um, it, There was a lot of compliance issues. There were a lot of things that, that weren't just weren't happening. They just weren't being done. And I was nervous because it was my... Uh, reputation on the line because he was refusing to do what I'd suggested to him. And even that conversation that didn't even involve money was uncomfortable. And a lot of people hate those conversations. And that's why, you know, they engage with with others to, to help them. And before you go down the legal path, there's obviously, obviously very on a basic level, there's, there's the virtual assistant who can help with this sort of thing. Anybody who's happy and comfortable with making phone calls on your behalf and writing emails, ask your bookkeeper as well. If you're silly enough not to have a bookkeeper, then ask your mum. <laughs> Just tell everybody not to be aggressive, of course. So say, for example, that you are in the position of um, you're a business and you've got a supplier who's giving you the runaround. Um, they're not delivering goods on time. Um, you are, what, what can you do legally? Are you allowed to withhold payment? And under what conditions can you withhold payment? So flipping it around at the moment, not with debt recovery, but more. When you're the consumer. Exactly. When, yeah, yeah. When the business is the, is the consumer. Yeah. I mean, um, with the Australian Consumer Law, um, which has been out since 2010, um, that applies to businesses as well, where, where their purchases of, of, of goods, um, which are over a certain value, or um, where those goods would ordinarily be for domestic purposes. That's paraphrasing it, but, but basically that's where um, the Consumer Law applies to, to business. Um, 
it's uh, it's um, it's important that you are aware of your rights as a, as a consumer. And I mean, it's a whole that's a whole different conversation. Mm, mm, but definitely. effectively, where you go to if you've got trouble as a as a business, where you are in that position, is the um, the New South Wales Consumer and Tenancy Tribunal. Um, it's a no cost tribunal where if you've got that dispute, you can just it's a very simple application form. You can fill it out yourself. You can you just explain what the problem is with your with your supplier, lodge the application, and they will ordinarily send, take you through that process. Are they a mediator as well? They'll they'll send you off to mediation, um, and so you can really get sorted those issues sorted with your with um, your supplier without having to engage a lawyer. Mm-hmm. Um, you can engage a lawyer if you if you feel the need. Um, but it's a no cost jurisdiction. Oh, I see. So, um, so effectively, you'll have to, uh, unless there are extraordinary circumstances, um, you'll have to pay for your own lawyer out of your own pocket. You can't get that money off the other side. I see. So they're not allowed to take a percentage. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. this might be something that if you've got a good relationship with your lawyer who's already put your contracts in place and already looked at uh, tenancy agreements and all these sort of things on your behalf, that they might uh, assist you with, with this sort of thing as well. Wait, was it the Small Business Commissioner that runs that um, area of they're, mediation? They're a separate um, organisation, but they also have mediation facilities. Um that they they work really well um, and they're quite efficient. So, if you if you again if you've got an issue uh, with a supplier or with a with a customer, either way for them, mm-hmm. um, you can um, contact um, the small business commissioner, lodge the application. They will then contact um, your the other side for you, arrange suitable dates mm-hmm. for you to come in, and they've got qualified mediators there who work through and who. They're, they're quite good because they don't just look at the issue, you know, oh, well, you, you know... You, this specific you, issue, they look at the bigger picture. Yeah, how long you've been working with each other for? Yep, yep. Like, what kind of industry are you in? Like, how can you, how can you guys work better together? Mm-hmm. Um, and so they, they work on keeping that relationship intact. Um, and so that, that's a really good service to have. I've heard very good things about them and they've got a, a great reputation actually, yeah. um, especially on the one-on-one level and, and maintaining relationships I think is what they're about as well. So yeah. um, Small Business Commissioner is, is one place you could potentially go and, and ring up to get some advice on this. Yep. Where was that, um, the other the other place you mentioned the where you can do, every, they do everything for you? With NCAT, the so New South Wales Consumer and uh, Tenancy Tribunal. NCAT, is that run under fair trading? Um, yes. Ah, okay, yeah, great. Yeah, Excellent. Yeah, so you can get on the phone and wait for half an hour to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Look, um, you're listening to Small Biz Matters. We're in the room with uh, Sean Kelleher, who is our local uh, solicitor specialising in debt recovery, among other things and lots of other aspects and wears many hats, as we all do as businesses. We're going to take a quick break and listen to some community service announcements. And when we come back, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about debt recovery and talk about um, the issue when it comes to consultants, because that's obviously fraught with um, with danger when it comes to debt recovery and agreements and, you know, well, you'll hear about it when we get back after the break. You're listening to Triple H 100.1 FM. So we've got Sean Kelleher, our local solicitor, on the uh, the show today talking all about debt recovery, which is a subject we really don't want to be thinking about but need to think about. And just before the break, we were talking a little bit about different relationships that you might have with your with your clients or with your suppliers and what your rights are and how to sort those um, issues out when they do arise. Now, when we were sitting down for this uh, interview and, and planning out this interview, one of the areas that you mentioned um, come up all the time with your clients are consultants. Um, can you take me through why that's an industry or an issue? It just seems to uh, come up, uh, up all the time. Sure, yeah. It's basically because, um, you know, there is sometimes a different expectation uh, in relation to what the client is expecting to receive and what the supplier is providing what the consultant's providing. Is that because it's of a creative nature or because it's not sort of tangible and X number of quantity of this Can widget? be both, can be both. I mean, like from a debt recovery perspective, probably the easiest is a childcare centre. Oh, okay. Because you've, you've got your child, mm-hmm. it's enrolled mm-hmm. for a certain period of time. It was there. It was there and she, and, and the, the fees are X. Yep. Easy. And, okay. you, and the agreements are, are, are steadfast. Yep. And you've got government in, agencies involved because they're overseeing everything. So that's it. So easy one. Easy, easy, easy. What's the hardest? The hardest is things like, you know, graphic designers, you know, IT consultants, 
um, software software providers where the the client is probably not and you know not an expert in that area. They know what they want, mm-hmm. um, but, but they don't know why they what they want, which is why they're going it, it, outsourcing. Exactly, and and um, but and sometimes they don't explain it as well as they they should, uh, and so the the supplier, the consultant, the the graphic designer comes in and provides a service, provide um, produces a result, and then there's a difference between what the, what their client is expecting and what they've actually provided. And there's some clear-cut things which are, there, there's certain expectations that businesses can have realistically, such as this is the deadline when I need it by and this is the amount that we agreed to. So those sort of things wouldn't be too wishy-washy. But I guess it's more the creative or, or the actual product that's been delivered that people argue about. Yeah, it is. And that's why it's so important that, um, you know, if you're in that industry that you, you get sign-off as the stages progress. So concept, sign-off. Uh, you know, stage one, sign off. Do you mean literally a piece of paper with a signature on it or an email trail is legally binding? E- email trail is it's legally fine. binding, but absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, you know, if you're if you're doing a, uh, a piece of work for a, sub- a business of a substantial size, they probably have a steering committee or a project committee mm-hmm. who will um, who will need to approve um, each each stage of that particular project. Um, and so if you're, if you're, if you're in that situation, absolutely get that sign off from that particular committee. If you're not working for, for a business which is as big as that and you're just working for, say, another small business, make sure you get the decision makers sign off in relation to um, each stage so that when you get to the final um, uh, result that there's, there is no disagreement and you've got that email, you've got that paper trail um, going back through the, through the entire project. There's two things you said I think that are very crucial to that point, which is decision makers... So it's all fine and well for, you know, the office manager or the receptionist to say, oh, yeah, that's fine. Um, but you actually need the person who is is the uh, the person who's ultimately going to be paying the bills or the person who's responsible for that project needs to be signing it off. And I like the way that you said at every stage. So for those of, of you out there who are creatives who haven't given much thought to this yet, perhaps you need to start breaking down the work that you do, and you can do this across all your clients into step one, step two, step three, step four, and in your mind, know what those steps are, and then have a system in place where you know at every step of the way, it's being signed off on. So you're saying sort of draft one, draft two, um, final approval, print approval. Absolutely. Depending on what industry you're in, you know, the stages are different, you'll know what stages they are, um, but absolutely get that approval. Another little tricky um, point is... When you're working for a company, um, sometimes you need to know that the board has signed off on your on engaging you, rather than just the general manager. Um, so there have been. How do you know what's what size company you're dealing with that may or may not have a board? Um, well, if if if, you're, if it's a company, then it's got a it's got a director. I see. Okay, so um, uh, so you need um, quite often you need to see the minutes. Of, of a of a company a company's meeting to say yes it's approved to, to engage Alexi to uh, act as our bookkeeper mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, because if a general manager goes off and engages you without board approval the board can then turn around and say no and was, we're not paying we're not paying and th- that's actually legally okay even yeah. though you've, you think you've got an agreement with the general manager yeah one of the things that we do as lawyers um, if we're acting for a company we always we ask to see the minutes the minutes which says yes uh, it's approved to engage us right we can't just go off the general manager okay so how do you have that discussion in the beginning is it uh, part of your engagement terms or is it a, a verbal conversation that you say when you're engaging with that particular client you know who is it that signs off on this work who is it that decides to work with me is it yourself or i mean you can't really ask for the minutes can you no but you can ask for the directors you can ask for something from the directors is it minutes and just just ask can i have something from a from uh, the managing director or, or or the board, or you know, a copy of the minutes which um, confirms my engagement, so that you know that you're engaged properly. I mean, it, I know it sounds like overkill, mm-hmm. and I know it sounds like you know, oh gosh, do I really need that? Mm-hmm. But if you're dealing with a company for the first time, um, then you need to know that you, you're being properly engaged. And I guess if you're sending them an engagement letter which you think is solid. 
but the wrong person signing it, it, it then almost voids it? Um, it? It makes it very difficult. For, it makes it, it it makes it difficult for you to to um, to go back and get that get what you deserve to be paid. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. And maybe the um, someone like an office manager in that sort of company or an administration manager might, if you, if you've engaged with them, you can casually say to them, you know, can I ask who is it that that signs off on this work? Absolutely. Yeah, because they they will know about the structure of a company and who does what. Yep. And that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Particularly, I guess, if you're working with something that's quite big, and if it's if you're a creative or a consultant, where what you're producing and and delivering is not x number of widgets and and there might be a bit of wishy-washiness down the track yeah it's a good way to protect yourself i'm sure you've seen plenty of examples where if this had just been in place in the beginning and the right person had signed the right piece of paper they wouldn't have ended up where they ended up that's right and then you've just got a whole three-way um you know dispute between you know the person who's acted outside their authority the the people who run the company mm, and mm. yourself and you don't want to be involved. So we in talked that. a bit about creatives. Now, one industry that seems to be so litigious and, and they just have so many safeguards is is tradies. Um, why is it that we still seem to see so many major issue and disputes and lots of, even though it's sort of surrounded by so much legislation? Why do you think that is from your perspective? Look, it's difficult to say. Um, I mean, the, the trades... And it's been around since 1999, um, so I'm sure most tradies are well aware of their rights in relation to it. But um, payment for tradies um, in New South Wales is governed by the Building Construction Industry Security of Payment Act. Mm-hmm. Um, Have they got payment terms that are specific? Yeah, oh. so there's a there's a real there's a real time frame and framework for which governs how how tradies can get paid, um, and it covers all construction work um, in New South Wales. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm sure most tradies will, will be aware of it, but it's absolutely important that on your invoice, you've got down the bottom, this is a payment claim made under the Building and Construction Industry Security of Payment Act. Oh, oh say that again, please. Um, this is a payment claim made under the Building and Construction Industry Security of Payment Act. Okay. Um, we could talk for three hours on, on that framework and what, what rights that the, the, the contractors have and subcontractors have and hand contractors and all that sort of thing. But um, if you're a tradie and you're not fully aware, go on to the um, Department of Fair Trading website, just type in, um, you know, building industry security payment um, and there's a great overview of how it all works. Awesome. So a real step-by-step thing. Yeah, yeah. It's, really, it's a really good explanation. And that's regardless of whether that person is working in the construction industry per se or if they're sticking in a spiral staircase into someone's home, they're still part of the construction industry? Yeah, there's, there's, um, uh, there's dollar limits which apply. So just go in there and, and you'll see where, um, how it all works in relation to, you know, whether your, your, the, the value of your job falls within the, the scope. Oh, that's awesome. And look, that's great that they've got so much legislation, but they are just one industry out of many. And wouldn't it be great if we could see things like payment terms or, um, you know, specific engagement terms across the board for small business? This is just, this is just, you know, yeah, I, I, honestly, <laughs> I think hard. I think we'll get there. I think um, you know, I think um, I mean this is not a legal opinion; it's just my opinion. But um, it seems that you know, small business is seen as a real driver, you know, of the economy. Duh. And, and uh, yeah, exactly. And you know, I, I think slowly but surely we are getting to a point where you know it will be easier for us to. If to, we take to all the red tape that's there for the ATO and BASs and payroll and pick up the same amount of red tape and dump it onto, um, you know, le- legislation and making sure that we're covered for payment terms and speeding up the economy that way, it's a no-brainer. Let's, uh, let's go over what we talked about today. So we talked about, um, you know, what you can do. You can write, you can send up lenders, your own letters of demand, be conscious of what is reasonable and making sure that you're compliant. We've talked about when you might engage with um, a litigation lawyer and what their process is. Other organisations such as Dun & Bradstreet, which are debtors, and how they work with different companies as well. Um, And you mentioned before that you yourself have a very clear pricing structure in your engagement letter. I guess when you're dealing with any consultant or subcontractor, make sure you have a clear, you know, pricing structure and know what it is that you're getting yourself into. Just quickly, can you just take me through what is it that makes you unique in terms of your pricing structure? Because I know it's a little bit, you don't just walk in and just go, right, clock sticking, go. No, no, no. I, so I do a, uh, um, an upfront fixed fee to, to send the letter of demand and the draft statement of claim. Right. Um, so that's, um, you know, 
$148. Yep. And it really doesn't matter to me whether it's I'm chasing $1,000 or $80,000. Price is the same. Right, Net okay. is the same, statement claims is the same. And like you said, uh, it's often just that initial engagement, whether it comes from you or from your lawyer or from Dun & Bradstreet, that first letter of demand that's written a certain way that will get the ball rolling and would you say a lot of claims are, are settled at that point? Yeah, I would say at least 50 or 60 are, are settled at that awesome. point. Um, and that is after, say, the, the client normally chasing the, the, the debtor two or three times themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and then they say, right, well, I've exhausted my own op options of getting this paid. Send it to someone like me. Mm. And then um, and I do that. And, uh, you know, 50, 50 to 60% of the time it, it, it produces a result. Awesome. Awesome. Look, well, thank you so much for coming on the show today, Sean. It's been fantastic. Um, we'd love to have you back on the show in another couple of months' time. We can talk at, a little bit about litigation with, with other areas of small business, which would be fascinating. But I think the listeners today have walked away with quite a few really great strategies that they can implement to get uh, to have the conversation with their clients and also to set up the correct engagement terms and the wording that needs to appear on their various documentation. So thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks. It's been great. You've been listening to Triple H 100.1 FM. My name is Alexi and we will be back next week on Small Biz Matters to talk all things small business. Have a great week, guys, and we will see you next Tuesday.